Thank you, choir. Thank you, Brenda. All of that was excellent. May we pray together. Prepare our hearts, O Lord, to accept your word. Silence in us any voice but your own, so that hearing we may also obey your will. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. In the aftermath of the fall of humanity, the Lord God pronounced a curse on all parties involved. The serpent, Adam and Eve, and even the land. And this curse is what Adam and Eve's disobedience unleashed into the world. Life as they knew it, life as we know it, would never be the same. As a part of this curse, God said to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. The serpent, remember, is the one who, in the Genesis story, sows distrust into the heart of Eve causing her and Adam to doubt God's goodness and ultimately rebel against Him. The serpent sowed a lie, which is why the church has said that the serpent was and is the devil, the father of lies. God says that there will be enmity between humanity and the devil from here on out. They will be at constant odds with one another, with one striking for the head, the other striking for the heel, each going for the kill. Fast forward to Numbers 21. And the fallout of this curse, the enmity between the serpent and humanity, is on full display. The people of Israel became impatient on the way to the promised land. And they spoke against God and Moses, asking, Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there's no food and no water, and we loathe this worthless food, referring to the manna that God had been providing from heaven. Imagine that. Imagine complaining about the food God had created from nothing to nourish you as He guided you on the way to the land He'd promised you. What profound ungratefulness and distrust. An ungratefulness and distrust displayed by Adam and Eve before them and us after them. So, the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people. And they bit the people so that many people of Israel died. There it is then, enmity with the serpent, the curse of sin unleashed, dealing out death, its fair and just wage. The people then came to Moses and said, we have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. Moses prayed. And the Lord responded, what did God do? And what does this have to do with Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus? With us? Only everything. For in lifting up a serpent, Moses prefigured a greater lifting up, by which you and I may live. If you have your Bibles... I would like to keep up in that, though of course the text will be available on your screen. Our scripture passage this morning comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 3. I'll be reading verses 9 through 15. Nicodemus said to Jesus, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you the teacher of Israel? And yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. 
If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in Him may have eternal life. This is the word of the Lord. Nicodemus asks one final question. He did a little bit of talking in the previous passage, but he will not speak after this. The spotlight will focus on Jesus, and he will deliver what is one of his best-known speeches. But Nicodemus' question is, how can these things be? Now, I've given you this advice before, and I'm going to give it again here. When you hear these things in your Bible, your first question ought to be, what things? The things in question are what we heard last week. The power of God to remake people from above. The mysterious ways in which the wind of the Spirit affects this change. We even heard stories of these things. Ranging from 77-year-olds coming to be baptized to recovering alcoholics praying for the first time in their life. How can these things things be? How is this possible? Now to be sure, I don't think Nicodemus's curiosity is genuine. I think he's doubtful. Sometimes we ask how, even though we mean no way, no how. I got a call from Sarah back in undergrad. She was driving what has become my Kia Forte, and had a flat tire. Man, I miss driving a truck. I met her at a gas station that she'd pulled off at, and she asked, can you help me put a spare tire on? I said yes, popped open the trunk, looked where the spare was supposed to be, and asked, how do you suggest we do that? There was no spare. So I asked how, but I meant no way, no how. Nicodemus asks how, but he means no way, no how. And we got into this last week, but I think it's worth asking again here. Do you sometimes find yourself sharing that sentiment? You can be born again. Okay, yeah, right. The Spirit transforms people. Oh, yes, I'm sure He does. Who you are right now, even at your worst, is not who you have to be. And how is that? Even stories, profound stories of life change that can only be described as being born again still leave us wondering, okay, but that's that's got to be the exception, right? Not the rule. How can these things be? How? How? Jesus says how, but before he does, he challenges the man who had come to challenge him. Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Aren't you the expert? Didn't you come here to set me straight? And hearing Jesus taunt someone, and I think it is a taunt, might unsettle our image of Gentle Jesus, meek and mild. But just remember, when you challenge God, you'd better be prepared to be challenged back. Job had the nerve to say to the Lord, Here is my signature. Let the Almighty answer. And God responded, asking, Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Nicodemus is a fault finder contending with the Almighty. And I think his how doesn't just concern what Jesus says, but also who Jesus is. He asks, how can these things be? Which is to say, and how do you know these things? He'll find out soon enough. Because this would-be teacher is about to be taken to school. 
See, Jesus is not theorizing about God. He is speaking of what he knows and bearing witness to what he has seen. Jesus is the Son of God. He is the Word who was in the beginning with God and was God. John says in the prologue of his Gospel, no one has ever seen God. No one except Jesus Christ. He is the unique Son of God. He has seen God and makes God known to us. He makes God known to you. No one has ascended into heaven, Jesus says, but the Son was in fellowship with the Father and the Spirit before the foundation of the earth. And He has descended to us. In Jesus, as Moses preached, the Word is very near you. Because He is the Word. And He became flesh and dwelt among us. When Jesus speaks of the work of of God the Father. His is the authoritative and definitive Word. When He speaks of the Father's providential plan to renew the hearts of men and women by the Spirit, He speaks as one who was in the room when it happened. Edward Clink writes in his commentary of John, quote, and only Jesus can speak in this way. There is no other person that can speak as such. Even the testimonies of the disciples are all derivative. Whereas the testimony of Jesus is the very fountainhead of Christian revelation. Thus, the testimony and message of Jesus is connected to his presence with God as a person of God. Jesus is, and I love this, he is the, thus says the Lord. End quote. So what says the Lord on this matter? What is Jesus' answer to our uncertain hearts? To our souls that wonder just how these things can be? His response is nothing short of the gospel itself. He says to Nicodemus, just as Moses lifted up a serpent, In the wilderness. Well, what is he talking about? He's talking about the story that we mentioned in the beginning. Israel asks Moses to pray for the Lord's mercy. And he did. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And everyone who is bitten, when he sees it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent, set it on a pole, and lifted it up. And if a serpent bit anyone, the author says, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. What Jesus has done here is read this story as an allegory. A story which carries a deeper meaning or serves as a symbol of something beyond itself. So Jesus understands Moses' raising of the serpent as having a hidden meaning, as anticipating something greater. Do you see it? Do you hear the connection he's trying to make? Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up That whoever believes in Him may have eternal life. God's work of healing through Moses bears witness to the lifting up of Jesus Christ. It's a foggy window through which we can begin to make out Calvary's mountain. The Israelites were given life by gazing upon a bronze serpent. And you and I Snake-bit people that we are, are given life by and through the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. The cross of Christ is the event because of which everything that can be said about the Christian life is true. These things, whatever these things are, being born again, being renewed by the Spirit, 
being given the right to become children of God, becoming new creations, whatever, can only be because Jesus Christ was lifted up. You're free from sin because Jesus Christ became sin for you. You are made whole because the body of Christ was broken for you. You may live because Jesus Christ died. And indeed, the quality of this life that the death of Jesus makes possible is so magnificent that it may only be described as life eternal. That's the thing about eternal life. It refers to a quality, not just a quantity. Gail O'Day writes in her commentary of John that eternal does not just mean endless duration of human existence, but is a way of describing life as lived in the unending presence of God. To have eternal life is to be given life as a child of God. End quote. John said that those who received Jesus and believed in His name were given the right to become children of God, to be adopted into God's family. And now, we know why. Because Jesus Christ was lifted up on our behalf. How much time, if any, do we spend reflecting on the cross of Christ? Does it ever, and this pun isn't intended, cross your mind? Are you filled with wonder because of the lengths to which God in Christ went for you that you may live? Is the cross before you or is it behind you? I fear that we so often have a what have you done for me lately attitude with God. We are so often like the Israelites. We stand on God's shoulders and imagine that we're flying. Our forgetfulness of the past has made us ungrateful in the present. Yes, God rescued us from 400 years of oppression, but why do we have to wander through the wilderness? Yes, God created food from literal nothing, but I don't like it. Yes, God is leading us to the land He promised us generations ago, but I mean, come on, couldn't He hurry up a little bit? And God would be within His rights to do to us as He did to the Israelites. To turn us over to that distrust and rebellion. To give us over to the serpents that would take our life. To let us have what we want because we know not what we ask. But he doesn't. He doesn't. Instead, the miracle of the gospel is that God shows his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God's response to our sin is not judgment, but mercy. And by His mercy, we live. In the same way then, that the serpent on a staff continues to stand as a symbol of healing within the medical community. Some of y'all didn't know that was from the Bible. It's from the Bible. So the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ remains Jesus' permanent answer to our question. How can these things be? That's how. St. Augustine, one of our church fathers, and a Christian who almost single-handedly charted the course of Western theology and philosophy. So anytime somebody tells you Christians aren't intellectuals, they just don't know their history. He summarized this passage well when he wrote, quote, In his mercy... God provided a remedy, a remedy that restored health at the time, but also foretold the wisdom that was to come in the future. Whoever has been bitten by the snakes of sin need only gaze on Christ and will have healing for the forgiveness of sins. End quote. 
I think the Christian life can in many ways be summed up in Augustine's instruction to gaze on Christ. Particularly, the cross of Christ. To reflect on the cross often. As one stanza of the hymn, I have decided to follow Jesus puts it, to put the cross before me as I make my way to the presence of the Father. And here's why I think that. And I'm willing to be proved wrong, but my wager is I'm not. Of course my wager's that, huh? Because I'm not sure that there is an uncertainty of ours that the cross does not resolve. I believe all of our how can these things be that we may ask can be answered by because the Son of Man was lifted up. Perhaps you struggle with self-hate. You have a hard time forgiving yourself, let alone believing that God, of all people, forgives you. Gaze upon the cross of Christ and hear Jesus' last breath as a prayer for you, Father, forgive them. Maybe you feel unnoticed, kind of like we've said to the kids, like you've slipped between the cracks of God's attention. Gaze upon the cross of Christ and discover just how mindful of you God is and the lengths to which He's willing to go to to find you. It could be that you, like so many, fear you are irredeemable. That your sins are too great. Gaze upon the cross of Christ and be reminded that this was done for you at the height of your sin. And maybe you, like so many of us, long to know that you are loved. That is so many of our heart's longings. It's just to know that we're loved. To know that someone sees you. Someone hurts when you hurt and wants you to be made whole. Perhaps that's what you wonder. Gaze upon the cross of Christ. For love, in the end, is what the cross is God's greatest demonstration of. For God so loved the world, Jesus says, that He gave His only Son so that whosoever believes in Him will not perish, but have life everlasting.